So Condi, these are interesting times. And uh, so one of the things that seems to have been going on in this administration has to do with the, uh, in this uh, little skirmish that's going on in Europe, um, has to do with the declassification of what used to be classified information. And this information is now being published. I'm sure the whole world knows what Putin's up to about a week before it happens. So could you, could you, how do you think, I mean, I mean, that's not that easy to declassify information, is it? I mean, you've been in the midst of that, and so what do you think, how do you think that decision was made? I mean, that's gotta be, there's gonna be a lot of discussions there, right? Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Tom, and yes, we, I don't have slides either, so everybody can relax. Uh, it is extraordinary. I've actually never seen it in all of my years of a government. Uh, the decision was made, and I think correctly, uh, that we should use the uh, intelligence that we were getting uh, in order to show that we were inside the Russian decision cycle. So we would say, he's going to do this, and then he would do that. They're going to do this, and then they would do that. And this had a couple of advantages. Uh, the first was that we were able to convince, I think, countries that might have been skeptical about what Russian intentions were that uh, we actually understood those intentions. And for instance, I think it had a big impact on the Europeans. Uh, when I look at how quickly the sanctions packages came together, uh, that doesn't happen overnight. So I suspect a lot of work went into showing this intelligence, getting ready, and then being ready to act once, uh, once the Putin invaded uh, Ukraine. I think the second um, really great impact is it's got to have had an impact on Vladimir Putin. Uh, he's got to be wondering, you know, kind of looking left and looking right, who is it? Because the level of the intelligence that we have is extraordinary. It's got to be uh, intelligence is coming from pretty close. And just to be clear, I don't have, I'm not relying on any special information here. This is just uh, reading between the lines myself from experience. And uh, that's got to be shaking uh, the Russian power structure a little bit. Um, I'm sure it wasn't an easy decision. Um, I don't know this, but I suspect that one of the reasons we got it this time is that we have an extraordinary director of the CIA, Bill Burns, uh, who comes not actually out of the intelligence community, but out of the diplomatic community, was uh, ambassador to Russia, was uh, the undersecretary for policy in the State Department, and knows how to use uh, intelligence in this way. And so I think it's a real breakthrough uh, in the, the ways to use intelligence. They've clearly done it without exposing uh, so-called sources and methods. I, I think it's really quite smart. Mm -hmm. So, Condi, I know that you have known uh, Vladimir Putin for some years, and you, of course, are a distinguished expert on you know, all things Russia and all things national security. But from what you know about the man, and, and what you've seen in terms of his behavior uh, in, say, kind of recent weeks and how he has uh, comported himself in public forums. I mean, what, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts about what's going on there? How much of this is calculated and how much of it is delusional? And kind of what, what, what's your read on what's happening? Well, first, let's look for a moment at how we got here. We got here through three essential miscalculations on Putin's part. The first was a miscalculation about the Ukrainians, um, a, a historical conceit that Ukrainians are just uh, Russians. You know, Tchaikovsky actually wrote a suite called the Little Russia Suite, which is about Ukraine. So this kind of goes deep into Russian history, but in fact, the Ukrainians are a different people. They are linguistically different. Um, I know because I speak Russian, Ukrainian, yes, but it's, it's harder. It's a different language. They have a different culture. Um, actually, Slavdom, if you will call it that, began in Kyiv, not in Moscow. Um, and the Ukrainians have always resented uh, the fact that the Russians don't recognize that. Uh, just imagine that if somebody in St. Louis, Missouri said, well, everybody knows that the Declaration of Independence was written here, right? And the Civil War really, uh, the, the uh, Revolutionary War began here. So 
this was an overestimation of how they would be received and probably an underestimation of what 30 years of Ukrainian independence has done even for the Russian-speaking populations of Ukraine. So first miscalculation. Second miscalculation that the West would be toothless and would do nothing. Um, after watching particularly what happened after Crimea, uh, even after Georgia, although I was Secretary of State during Georgia, we managed to preserve the independence of Georgia, the independence of the Georgian government, Saakashvili, kept them out of Tbilisi. But maybe thinking, well, you know, they'll jump up and down, they'll do no idea that the sanctions would look like this. So another miscalculation. And to my mind, the biggest miscalculation, his own forces. Um, after 20 plus years of billions of dollars of investment, turns out the Russian military forces are not very good. And so you have these miscalculations. Now, anybody can miscalculate, but I think that it shows that something has happened to him over the last couple of years. And I actually said this a couple of months ago in watching him. The Vladimir Putin that I knew was coldly calculating, unemotional, very often spoke in almost a whisper, so you had to listen very hard for what he was saying. Uh, this Vladimir Putin is erratic. He's berating people on television. Uh, he's sitting a mile from his generals when they are speaking to him. Um, and he seems to have gone deeper and deeper into a delusional version of this history that suggests to me that somewhere over the last couple of years, he's it's not that he's crazy, but he's living in a kind of alternative universe about how to think about uh, what they were about to do. Uh, it is indeed somewhat dangerous uh, because uh, you know, it's a very powerful country. Um, it'll be interesting to see if there's anyone who can tell him that things are not going well. He keeps repeating uh, to Macron and to the Israeli prime minister and others, uh, it's all going according to plan. Does he really believe that? I suspect he doesn't, which is why I think we had that strange rally at the stadium the other day. Uh, but I will just tell you, after spending a lot of time with him, this isn't quite the same person. Now, I will tell you this. Um, you know how you go back and you think, if I put, if I connected the dots a little bit differently, I might have seen something different. Uh, the degree to which, which his Russian nationalism uh, extreme Russian nationalism, this idea of Russia as the center of Eurasia, an ideological uh, tendency. Uh, that, in retrospect, I see. I see that when I spoke with him one day uh, at, the Kremlin, at his office at the Kremlin, and he said, um, you know, Condi, you know us. He said, Russia's only been great when it's been ruled by great men, like Peter the Great and Alexander the Second. Now, every body, bone in your body wants to say, and do you mean Vladimir the Great? But your Secretary of State, you can't say that kind of thing, right? It would be, it would be rude. But I think that's who he believes he is. And it is his responsibility now to restore Russian greatness, to reunite the Russian people. He told President Bush that the reason he said that the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union 25 million Russians were left outside of Mother Russia. So there is an ideological cast here that you could see. Um, you could see in that speech that, uh, you know, this former KGB officer, uh, his anger perhaps at communism and the communist for destroying the Russian Empire, for not being tough enough to defend, uh, that all now starts to make sense in retrospect. So when you look back at this event, you know, what do you think his end game was when he started? And what do you think his end game is now? Is it the same or do you think it's changed? Yeah, well, I think the end game when he started, uh, based on these miscalculations uh, that I cited at the beginning, was that uh, they would race into Kiev. Uh, it would take three, four days. Uh, they would uh, overthrow the Zelensky government, which he had branded as uh, Nazis, fine trick since Zelensky is Jewish, but uh, he'd branded, it, branded as Nazis and drug dealers. Um, I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect they might have even had a changeling, uh, you know, a quizzling inside the Ukrainian uh, power structure. 
who was going to stand up and say, you know, I can deal with the Russians, he'd have then maybe at least a pro-Russian government, if not a government that was prepared to join in a kind of confederation with Belarus and Russia. I think that was the, that was the image. And they would be welcomed because, of course, the Ukrainians might do this. Uh, his end game now appears to be, if I can't own Ukraine, I will simply destroy it. And so what you're seeing now is the Russian army is clearly stalled. Now, I, I don't put all that much stock in some of the things that the Ukrainians say about this because, you know, they, they want to present a certain view of how well they're doing. But American assessments now say that with the exception of a few places around Mariupol and uh, perhaps uh, in the southeast, uh, Russian forces were stalled. One way that we know that they probably thought it was four or five days was they went with five days' worth of food and five days' worth of gas, uh, gasoline. So they're not moving particularly well. They've been pushed back in some places. And so maybe that dream now of actually taking Kyiv has been supplanted by one that I will just bomb civilians and bomb civilian targets, the kind of Grozny uh, in Chechnya or uh, Aleppo in Syria uh, strategy, and eventually the Ukrainians will, will cave. Uh, and I think that probably is where he is uh, now. Um, I've been asked on a number of occasions, is there an exit ramp for him? Uh, the problem is that Russian Tsars who lose wars don't do very well. And um, I, I suspect that he's got to find some way to either dress up what they get as a victory, which is kind of hard given the maximalist aims at the beginning, or keep going and just destroy the place. And um, I'm fearful that we're looking at the second of those because this is a very unsentimental, very brutal man surrounded by very unsentimental, very brutal people. Now, a couple of interesting uh, sidelights recently. Um, they put some people under house arrest from the intelligence services. Somebody's looking for a scapegoat. Uh, the defense minister, Shoigu, um, not the smartest creature God ever created. I spent some time, some time with him, um, is uh, suddenly not so visible anymore. And, um, and Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister who I dealt with a great deal, um, is either putting on a front of trying to negotiate, or he may actually be trying to search for some place to land, because he is a smart guy, and I doubt that he really wants to end up in The Hague. So um, there is movement around them, but nothing that would suggest to me that uh, Putin is ready to take a deal. And so under the, under the general category of glass being half full, I mean, what do you see as the best possible outcome? I mean, what, the what, best, what? best possible outcome is the Russians are defeated, okay? mm -hmm. that, that, they're, that literally they're defeated, mm -hmm. uh, that having lost and that's a positive, that's a non-zero probability. That's a, it's a non-zero probability, mm -hmm. and I will tell you, I would not have said that two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but what do I mean by defeated? All right, by, by defeated, I mean that uh, they have to, after, after having lost as many as eight, 9,000 soldiers, someplace according to American estimates, and uh, American military people will tell you that the, uh, that the ratio of losses, deaths to uh, wounded is probably someplace in the five times that category. So we've lost, they've lost a lot of people. They've lost five generals. Um, at that point, if they had to withdraw from these Ukrainian cities, uh, even if they've reduced a number of them to rubble, that would be a serious defeat for Russia. Now, it is absolutely the case that Putin would probably try to dress it up as a victory. Um, but we have to turn also to what's happening to the Russian people. Um, I was a graduate student in the Soviet Union in 1979. And the Soviet people looked at their feet. They never traveled. 
they accepted whatever green shoes in size nine central planning spit out that year. There was a picture in the New York Times that was worth a, a thousand words. It had these very well-dressed Russians in a mall trying to get their money out of ATMs. And there is a class of people in Russia, and it's not just intellectuals, it's not just the software engineers that you're reading about who are leaving. It, it's middle class people who spoiled their kids at McDonald's and bought their furniture at Ikea and had 30 year mortgages on their apartments and traveled to Bulgaria on, on uh, vacation. And for them, this is a shock. Now, it is true that the uh, propaganda that Putin is spitting out about, you know, R Russia was under attack and the Ukrainians are bombing their own people and apparently Lavrov told the Ukrainian foreign minister, those are actors, those uh, maternity ward people and so forth. That, that, no doubt that they're doing that. But anybody under the age of 40 doesn't watch television in Russia. And so, there is leakage. There are people who are beginning to know. And somebody's going to have to account for the eight, nine thousand plus, plus, plus body bags that are going to start to come back. These are peasant boys. These are 18, 19 year old conscripts. And by the way, they are led by arrogant, entitled, incompetent Soviet, or sorry, Russian uh, generals and Russian officers with no intermediate level. The United States military will tell you that the best thing we've got going for us is, is the non-commissioned officer rank, okay? The master sergeants who are that layer between the officers and the, they don't have that. A few years back, Sergei Ivanov, who was then the defense minister, uh, asked Don Rumsfeld about how we had built that NCO because he, he said, we need that rank. So they have significant morale problems everywhere that they go. So uh, not inconceivable that they, I think it will be hard for Zelensky and the Ukrainians to continue to sustain the civilian losses that they are sustaining and not want to find some way out. But if you ask me what is my best case, they're defeated. Now, going back to our original discussion where we're talking about the, uh, <clears throat> the United States kind of leaking classified information and with just kind of... Uh, not, not leaking, Tom. No, we don't, uh, we don't not, leak. Not like releasing. Sorry. Releasing, right. Thank releasing. You. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I stand corrected. Thank you. Uh, publishing uh, what would previously have been classified information uh, with just kind of uncanny uh, accuracy. It's just been scary how accurate it has been. And now on Monday and Tuesday, we have the comments out of the White House that well, we need to be concerned about the prospects of kind of massive cybersecurity attacks against critical infrastructure in the United States. And now this has been amplified this morning by the FBI, which has jumped on this yes. and uh, appears to give this uh, kind of more credence. Um, and, kind of, what are your thoughts on uh, the vulnerability of critical infrastructure, be it financial systems or power grid systems? And um, I mean, honestly, this sounds a little concerning. I'm, I'm very concerned about uh, this piece, and not just in the United States, potentially in, in Europe uh, as well. Uh, in 2007, the Russians shut down Estonia, to shut it down. And uh, so that capacity is there. Um, I suspect that, again, one of the reasons that this information is being put out there is not just as a warning to companies and the like to, to button down the hatches. And by the way, go home and button down the hatches wherever you live. Uh, but also uh, as a little bit of a warning to the Russians that uh, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't wait for, quote, attribution if something were to happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, we're pretty good. And so I hope that somebody's telling the Russians, uh, don't engage in mutually assured destruction on, 
on uh, cyber attacks because you won't like where this ends. And do you think they have a concept of a red line? Because, I mean, in other things that have happened with OPM and solar winds, it was kind of... Yeah, uh, you know, there, if, if, a... if Putin were less um, aggressive and less reckless right now, I would say you try to go up to a place where the United States might not react. So you'd have some uh, attacks on a few key companies, maybe something along the line we had with the Colonial Pipeline, et cetera. Uh, you know, acts of war, go after the grid, uh, try to bring the, down the financial system. Um, now you're talking about things that I would hope you would have warned uh, that we would consider that an act of war. And, and I want to just say one thing about um, the importance of the language that our leaders use right now. Uh, if I could ask the president to stop doing one thing, because I actually think they've done pretty well under the circumstances. Stop saying what you won't do. Just stop. Because you want to introduce into your adversary's mind the view that you might just do anything. And so, and by the way, stop saying we won't fight World War III in Ukraine. Uh, that's not what this is about. Uh, I don't think we are going to fight World War III in, in Ukraine. And by the way, I also don't want to fight it in Poland, the Czech Republic, and Germany. So um, I would. I think the language needs to be a little less defensive, if you will. It's not that you want to be offensive. It's not that you want to escalate the language. But I think you want to be a little bit less defensive with the language. But on the, the cyber attacks, yes, I think it's quite worrying. It's very scary. I, mean, I was on the phone at 6 o'clock this morning with Homan to make sure that we were, we were prepared to unplug everything from yeah. the wall. Yeah. Um, it, um, uh, well, in the, in the few minutes we have left, maybe what we should do is like throw this open to some questions. I'll bet, you know, maybe, you know, Gary or, you know, okay. some of you, Gary? you know, Gary have some, some please raise your hand and, you know, and join the dialogue. Come on, guys, somebody's got to have some. Ray. What's your assessment of China's play on yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I agree with you, although I'll say this. Um, you know, we have this view of the Chinese being very strategic and, you know, and Sun Tzu and so forth and so on. They've had the dumbest foreign policy in the last couple of years that I've, that I've seen. So what have they gotten with Wolf Warrior and Belt and Road and all these things? Uh, they've gotten Australia, the United States, and Great Britain united. They've gotten India, Japan, Australia, the United States into a quad, and oh, by the way, most of Southeast Asia as well. You couldn't draw it up better if you were the United States than to have China have everybody balance against them. So sometimes they make, the thing about authoritarians is when they make mistakes, they make doozies. We, we have this thing about, you know, they build great airports, they can do the things we, uh, just imagine in a democracy if you tried to have a one-child policy. Just imagine, any of them, Brazil, Turkey, the United States, they couldn't have done it. But they did it in China, and now 34 million Chinese men don't have mates. Now it's, we'll have two children, three children, as many children as you can, now but nobody wants to have kids. And so, I, I, so that brings me the question of the alliance with Russia. Um, I will admit that this has deepened the relationship between Russia and China more so than I thought it would. Uh, because it's hard to see Vladimir Putin playing second fiddle to Xi Jinping. It's also a question of what's China getting for this. But to the degree that there is this ideological view that they had to unite against Western liberalism and so forth, I can kind of see it. So now let's imagine that conversation in Beijing a few, a uh, couple months ago. Oh, you know, I have to do this little thing in Ukraine. Uh, it'll take three or four days. Uh, Ukraine's really part of Russia. You understand, because you have that Taiwan problem. And Xi Jinping says, yeah, just don't do it until the Olympics is over. And now he finds himself in partnership with a country that can't move its military forces, but is laying waste to a country of 43 million people has united the world around sanctions that will touch Beijing. And while the language out of the foreign ministry and the like, uh, and everybody that I talk to talks to Chinese diplomats and the like, it's, it's the Russian line right down 
down the, the uh, pike. However, I'm also told that Chinese banks, for instance, are not violating those uh, 311 <coughs> sanctions. Because um, just ask yourself, if you're China and you're a friend now of Russia, how much do you really want to put at risk your European and American business to help out the Russians at this point? So I think there are some limits. The one place that I think the Chinese may try to really take advantage, and it would be in their own interest, is they've been trying for several years now to get around dollar-denominated transactions. Uh, using the yuan, uh, whether it was with the, the deal with, uh, to deal with the Iranians. Um, some say that that Gazprom contract of a few years ago was actually in uh, Chinese currency. And they have built out this digital network for payments. So uh, they may want to look at this as a kind of dress rehearsal of could you get around the dollar. So that's where I think you might. But I, I think they'll be, they'll be cautious about uh, how much they help. Uh, Horacio, you had a, you had a question? A uh, uh, little lot over yeah. here, we'll give you a microphone. Thank you. Continuing the line of uh, China, what, would, uh, what is your perspective of the economic attack of China in Central and Latin America? Yeah, well, there, look, there's no doubt that the Chinese, um, who for decades, uh, engaged in a policy of what they called um, hide, and, hide and bide, you know, where you didn't show your power and you waited. Well, one, one has the sense that Xi Jinping believes that their time has come and that the United States is weak, the West is weak, et cetera, et cetera. And this shows up in uh, Chinese um, uh, incursions into parts of the world where you would not expect them, not just Africa, but Latin America, et cetera. Um, they've done it in, um, it used to be there was kind of mercantilism, you know, it was just kind of in search of resources. But now it seems to be more, uh, particularly in some places, uh, infrastructure, uh, taking ownership in infrastructure, and so more permanent presences in these places. Um, I tend to think that it's a, a strategy that may have less payoff in the long run. It turns out that loan to own, you know, you get a country to take out a big loan and then if they can't pay it back, you own the infrastructure. That didn't work so well in the 21st century. Now, it might have worked pretty well in the 19th century, it doesn't work so well in the 21st century. And countries are starting to push back against that. Uh, part of it is that the United States and the European allies really have to be more active, particularly the United States, in these places with things that work. I remember talking to the, the president of Liberia at the time, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and she said, I really want these contracts to be held by, they have big rubber uh, industry. She said, I want to be held by Americans or British. I said, why? She said, because you have Foreign Corrupt Practices Acts. And so I know when my ministers get a payment, it's actually going to the right thing. And so we have some cards to play, too, and we haven't played them very well. It's left the field more open uh, to the Chinese, but I think there's, uh, there's plenty of room to, to counter uh, those, uh, those um, in, incursions. Anu, did you have a question? I did, if you don't mind. Yes. Big time. Yeah, uh, mine's a two-part question. So one is, where does NATO go from here? You know, at the end of the war, uh, you know, you were, you were in support of Ukraine being part of NATO at one point, and I don't know where that stands. And I guess my second question is, has he gone far enough to be tried as a war cr criminal when this yeah. whole thing's over? Yeah. Um, on the second, um, I would have said, had I been President Biden, um, and probably wouldn't have gone as far as Vice President Harris did, I would have said, you know, that's a matter for investigation. Right? And there's a reason for that, which is that when you declare somebody a war criminal before the investigation, where do you give them a place to get off? Now, I don't have too many doubts that the, uh, what they've engaged in, uh, particularly these attacks on civilian populations, which are, uh, they're actually not indiscriminate. They're clearly attacks on civilian populations. We all know that those would constitute war crimes. I would be careful and would still, as a former official, be careful about how we get to those determinations. 
because I think it's really important that that is something that means something to the international system as a whole. Um, but let me say this. Can you ever imagine Vladimir Putin walking into number 10 Downing Street or into the White House again? Probably not. So Russia is about to be as isolated as it has been at any time, perhaps since the end of the reign of Joseph Stalin. Just think about that. That's uh, very sad for the Russian people. Now, um, to um, the, the question was on, uh, it, yeah, NATO expansion. You know, it's funny, we used to go to these NATO meetings and we would talk about, oh, NATO in Afghanistan, NATO here, and the Poles and the Czechs and others would say, no, you don't understand. The reason we want to be in NATO is because that's a revanchist beast to the East. It turns out they were right. And so uh, my view about NATO expansion is I want to fight the Russians as far East as possible. And I would have preferred that Ukraine was at least on the road to NATO expansion because I don't actually believe I will tell you this, in the eight years that I worked, quote, with Vladimir Putin, he never mentioned NATO expansion, never mentioned it, not in a meeting with me, not in a meeting with President Bush. And so this is, a, this is made up. And when Western analysts say, well, it was because you expanded NATO, really? That's why he decided Ukraine isn't a real country? So I think we did the right thing. Now, where does NATO go from here? Uh, a friend of mine said, Vladimir Putin has, within a few weeks, ended uh, Swiss neutrality and German pacifism. Uh, you are going to have a much stronger NATO. You're going to have the reinforcement of the eastern flanks with Americans in those heavy brigades in Poland and the Baltic states. You're going to have a Germany that now wants to fly F-35s. Uh, you know, nice job, Vladimir Putin. If you, if you were worried about NATO on your doorstep, now worry about NATO on your doorstep. So I think that NATO is stronger now than it has, uh, has been. Uh, I'll just mention, Tom, I know we're running out of time, but just the other thing that's going to really have to be considered here, because I know we have some people from the energy uh, sector. You know, the one thing we've learned is that uh, having our uh, energy dependence on Russia, Iran, and uh, the, the Middle East is probably not the greatest thing for national security. Uh, particularly given that we were given the gift of the North American platform from Canada down through Mexico uh, that would have allowed us to be the principal source of, uh, the, the primary source of energy. It takes infrastructure, uh, like the Keystone Pipeline, it takes infrastructure like terminals to be able to deliver LNG efficiently. And every, um, every time the administration talks about the energy transition for climate, I think it's going to be a wow, right? I would rather those hydrocarbons come from here than those places. And so you're already hearing the Germans say they probably made a mistake in becoming so dependent, Nord Stream 2 will never be built, but they're going to have to figure a way to, uh, to uh, get out, out of this uh, dependence. And I certainly hope that the United States is going to revisit again some of our decisions uh, around energy. Look, I'm as much as anybody, I want to make a, a transition to, to low carbon uh, environment, but it's going to be a while. And until that happens, let's have the hydrocarbons uh, come from here. One final question. Thank you very much. Um, there is, has been a religious schism between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Greek Orthodox Church going back 800, 900 years. And the Greek Orthodox Church supports independence of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Do you see this religious um, background as a factor to some of this erratic invasion behavior? You know, it's a really interesting question. You know, um, the, the relationship between Russian Orthodoxy and uh, Tsarism uh, is a very interesting one. The double-headed eagle, the Tsar looking toward divinity and toward, uh, toward humans. Um, the Russian Orthodox Church, you know, when I visited the Kremlin apartments for the first time, I was, I was the young Soviet specialist for, the, for President George H.W. Bush. And I went ahead of when he was going to visit, and they said, oh, well, we thought he might like to stay in the Kremlin apartments. And we go, and I thought, no, I don't think so. 
uh, you know, there's like Stalin's apartment and Lenin's apartment and the Rurik apartments and, and every bedroom is a, a bedroom with some huge chapel off the side. So this relationship has been there for a long time. And you're right about the schism. And I don't know if you know, the Russian Orthodox Church actually refused a while ago to, to, uh, re to recognize the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And uh, so there is something there. Now, I'm told by others uh, that Putin often talked about his religiosity. And we had a tendency to, uh, to dismiss it. I mean, what KGB man is really religious, right, was sort of our thought. But uh, some who know him say that he is in that way. And one of the things that I was not very happy to read was that he'd been spending some of COVID, uh, Gary probably knows this, some of COVID with Kovacek, who's a, a not really good guy and kind of a mystic. And so uh, maybe there's something there, but um, I, I tend to think it's great power politics, not uh, religion, but I would suspect that the Russian Orthodox Church would expect to benefit uh, from any further domination of Russia into, uh, into the West. Okay, well, Condi, on a personal note, and on behalf of the entire you know, C3AI uh, customer and company community, you know, we thank you for your presence here, we thank you for your leadership to the nation and your service to the nation. Okay, and we thank you for your, you know, your penetrating insights in this discussion. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join. Thank us. you.